Well, uh, now is the time in our service where we hear from God's Word through the reading and preaching of the Word. And if you're visiting with us, we're working our way through the Gospel of John. So we go verse by verse through books of the Bible. We started in chapter 1. We're moving uh, all the way through the Gospel of John. And uh, Lord willing, we will um, make our way. Uh, sometime before Jesus comes back to the end of the Gospel of John. So we are in John chapter 3. The scripture that was already read for us, 317 to 21. John 3, chapter 3, verse 17 to 21 is what we're going to focus on this morning. Um, But I'm going to back up our reading to verse 16. And I'll read 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe Has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that light, the light, has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth, comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's ask him for help. Oh Lord God Almighty, we acknowledge our own weakness. Lord, we have small attention spans for thinking deeply. We often bow out when uh, we're challenged in our thinking. So Lord, help us in our weakness. We also confess our sinfulness that all too often we have far longer attention spans for social media, for movies, for sporting events than we do to hear your voice as you speak to us in your word. And so, Lord, we're asking the help from your spirit to give us a soul that is riveted to hear from your word, that comes ready, anxious, much like your servant Samuel who said, Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. We want to hear you speak to us from your word this morning. But Lord, we also know that sometimes that means that it can be a painful hearing as you challenge our thinking, you challenge our living, you challenge our believing. And so Lord, I pray that you would give us humble hearts to to repent wherever we need to repent. Also, Lord, we some come here this morning trodden down by trials and difficulties in this world. Grant them comfort in the gospel this morning. Grant them hope and joy in the gospel that you might receive the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Charles Spurgeon, who was a Baptist preacher during the Victorian era in the 1800s, pastored a large church in the area of London. At one point, somebody came up to him and asked him, how do you reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility? Mr. Spurgeon responded by saying, I don't. He continued, I don't reconcile friends. I reconcile enemies. And God's sovereignty and human responsibility are not enemies. They are friends. 
Now, obviously, Mr. Spurgeon, uh, on the one hand, was avoiding that tension of God being the one who's sovereign, who He's the one who does the regenerating. John 3, 8, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound of it. You do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with the Spirit. The, that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He blows wherever He pleases. But yet we also see within the same context, believe. You must believe. You're responsible to believe. If you don't believe, you're judged already. And this is not actually something that's new in the Scripture. While this is a tension in our minds, a, a tension that's difficult to resolve, uh, throughout the Scripture, these truths are laid side by side with one another without apology, often without explanation. For instance, perhaps you're familiar with that great invitation that Jesus gives uh, in the Gospel of Matthew when He says, Come unto Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For My yoke is easy and My burden is light. Well, within that same context, just a sentence or two above that, in Matthew 11.25, it says, At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to in infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, in anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Next breath. Come unto me. In other words, whatever tension there exists in our minds didn't exist in Jesus' mind, because he could say, on the one hand, nobody knows the Father except whoever I will to reveal him to. On the other hand, come. We see similarly in Romans chapter 9, on the one hand, God has mercy upon whom he has mercy. By the end of the chapter, he's indicting Israel for not believing, for not trusting. And of course, it's within this same context that on the one hand, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you can't, you can't. John 3.3, 3, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. John 3.5, you cannot even enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. Well, how are you born again? It's the Spirit who does it. The Spirit, He blows wherever He pleases. But as the conversation continues, John 3.16, John 3.15, John 3.17, you must believe. These truths laid side by side. God is the one who saves, yet man is responsible to believe. And so my aim this morning is to help you to see God is the one to get all the glory for salvation. And man, being responsible, is to get all the shame for damnation. Three reasons. First is the mission of God. Verse 17, right on the heels of John 3.16, which, by the way, if you have a, a, a red letter Bible, um, which I'm not a big advocate of red letter Bibles, you know, red letter Bible, that's where all... The words that Jesus utters uh, in the Gospels are in red letters. Okay, the reason why I don't like them, I'm not telling you to go throw it out if you have it, but it is that sometimes it, it presents this dichotomy as if Paul's words are less than Jesus' words. But if we believe what the Scripture says about the Scripture, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, then Isaiah's words, Moses' words, Paul's words, Jesus' words are all God's words and therefore are binding upon us. We can't, we can't have certain levels of inspiration when it comes to the Scripture. That being said, minor theological rant aside, 
Red letter Bibles have a real difficulty when it comes to this section because it's not exactly clear where Jesus stopped speaking. Uh, some people think he stopped speaking at the end of verse 15. Some at the end of verse 14. Um, you have to make an interpretive decision. My interpretive decision uh, is that Jesus is still speaking. By the time we get all the way through to verse 21, Jesus is still talking here. And one of the arguments that Jesus is not talking is that Jesus uh, speaks of the Son of Man, the Son of God, often in the third person. But if you read the Gospels, you realize Jesus often speaks of himself in the third person. So I take it to be Jesus is still speaking here. This is still a conversation with Nicodemus. And he's just said in verse 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17, Jesus now clarifies his mission. On the heels of this, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. You notice the repetition of the words world, believe throughout this section. And notice it starts with four. This is another explanation. And Jesus is now going to give us the negative of this explanation of why God did not send Jesus. And, and it's interesting. Because he says, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. Now this demands a little bit of explanation. You have to understand that the mindset of the Jewish people of this day, and almost certainly the mindset of Nicodemus, would be that when Messiah comes, he will come and he will trounce down the world, the Gentile world, and he will deliver his people, Israel, from the yoke of Roman bondage. And so that when Messiah comes, it would be a mission of judgment. Now, in part of that, there's some very good biblical reason for that. Because when you're reading through the Old Testament, there are many passages that speak of when Messiah comes, that he would come in judgment. But we now realize in light of the New Testament, those passages are to be interpreted not as the first coming, but what? The second coming. For Jesus in the first coming comes to save sinners, but in the second coming indeed does come to slay sinners. And so, Jesus is clarifying the mission of the first coming. His first coming, God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world. Now, again, this needs some clarification because there are many passages that speak of Jesus being the judge. And John actually is going to clarify that, that the inevitable result of the mission of Jesus, while it is a saving mission, results in judgment. But the primary purpose was not judgment. J.C. Ryle says, I think that Nicodemus, like most Jews, was filled with the expectation that when Messiah came, he would come with power and great glory to judge all men. Our Lord corrects this notion in this verse. He declares that Messiah's first advent was not to judge, but to save people from their sins. And so while... It is not the purpose of the sun to cast shadows. It is the inevitable result of the sun that shadows are cast. And so similarly, John continues in 3.17, but that the world might be saved through him. And, and again, I take world as uh, being the same world that he spoke of in 3.16, fallen humanity, that, that the mission of God in Jesus was the salvation of sinners, and not exclusively to Israel, but also to the Gentile world. And then verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. This is an amazing promise. He who believes in Jesus is not judged. 
This is similar to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. For there is now what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says something similar in, in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. This is the wonderful news. In the mission of God in Jesus, as Jesus came and died, he would absorb the full judgment of God the Father upon His back so that sinners like you and I can know that we will not face the judgment in the future. We are acquitted. We are pardoned. To use Paul's term, we are justified before God because of what Jesus did. Christian, that is good news this morning. No matter what your sin is, it's paid for by Jesus if you have been united to Him. If you are trusting in Him. If you are believing in Him. You can say with confidence. I have eternal life. I will not come into the judgment. Because it's been paid for. No. Biblical Christianity is the only religion that could say that without pride. Because every other religion you get in the door based upon your performance. But Christianity gets in the door as a believer based upon the performance of another, the Lord Jesus Himself. And so, take comfort this morning, Christian, if you are united to Jesus, because you will not come into the judgment. But he goes on to say, he doesn't stop there in verse 18. He says, He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So he who does not believe is judged. So that while the mission of Jesus is a saving mission and the purpose is not judgment, there is an inevitable result of judgment when people do not respond as they're supposed to respond. And it's their fault that they don't respond. It's not God's fault. There's no lack in the mission. There's nothing wrong with the mission. God, in this sense, does indeed give an opportunity to all. It is a saving mission. But those who believe not are... Notice what it says. They are judged already. There is already a sentence cast upon them. Even though the final climactic judgment has not taken place, the very fact that they have not believed in Jesus is judgment upon themselves. It is evidence that will be gathered one day for the final judgment. As I mentioned earlier, just as the intention of a lamp or the sun is not to cast shadows. It is the inevitable result. When Jesus comes to this world and people don't receive Him by faith, they stand under the judgment. The, the sword of Damocles hangs over their head. They are guilty. There is an oughtness to believing in Jesus. And notice the language John uses here in verse 18. They have not believed in the name of the Son of God. They have not embraced. Name speaks of His character, His person. They have not embraced all of who He is. And this is damnable. This is a serious matter. 
The sentence means that the man who refuses to believe on Christ is in a state of condemnation before God, even while he lives. The curse of a broken law which we all deserve is upon him. The sins are upon his head. He is reckoned guilty and dead before God. And there is but a step between him and hell. There is but a heartbeat, but a breath between the unbeliever and eternal condemnation. And so friend, if you're sitting here this morning in a state of unbelief, you've not yet trusted in Jesus as your only hope, as your Savior, as your Deliverer from the wrath to come, the only thing separating you and an eternity in hell is your next breath. And it is God Himself who grants you that next breath. He is the one who is upholding you. So my friend, don't don't delay. Don't put it off. Trust in Christ alone for your eternity. There could be no more important matter in all of human existence. When compared with this great weighty reality of your eternity, whether the Cleveland Indians win tonight or not is of little value. What you have for lunch is of little significance. Because this is forever matters. This is eternal matters. Young person growing up in a Christian home who regularly hears the Gospel. Don't put it off. Don't delay in this matter. Eternity is forever. If you do not believe in the Son, you are judged already. God's judgment sits upon you. But you can be pardoned of it all. Now someone may at this point say, well what about that innocent person in some tribal village in Africa who's never heard about Jesus? Are they condemned? And the answer is no. They're not condemned. Because they don't exist. I said the innocent person in Africa who's never heard the gospel. There is no innocent person on planet earth. And if you don't believe that, you just need to have some children. (laughs) Nobody is innocent. We're all born into this world self-centered rebels against the Creator thinking that all the universe should bow to the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. We're all under condemnation, but the mission of God is a saving mission. This is the heartbeat of the Almighty. He's a deliverer. He's a good, kind God. As the older writers used to say, the judgment of God is His strange work. It's His strange work. Because there's a very real sense in which He he does not delight in it. But it is a necessary work, part of his holy integrity. And so this, is a, this saving mission is a mission we ought to align ourselves with. In fact, when you get to the end of the Gospel of John, as Jesus is, is praying in John chapter 17 and verse 15 and following, Jesus is praying to the Father. This is his high priestly prayer. And he's praying for his disciples. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. So, so Jesus, this is, this is very important because sometimes we think, why doesn't, you know, after somebody gets converted, beam me up, Scotty. We just go out. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. They that is the disciples, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. 
And then he prays, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Did you get that? Jesus prays that we would not be taken out of the world, but that we would be sanctified from the world to go back to the world. And, and notice Jesus says, this is like mine. Just as you sent me, Father, into the world, I send them into the world. Well, based off of John 3, 17 and 18, why did the Father send Jesus into the world? To save the world. Just like we said last week with God so loved the world. This is the heartbeat of God. A love, a compassion for fallen humanity. This is a good temperature taker, right? How hot is your temperature when we take it in regards to your compassion, your love, for lost people to be rescued out of this world. Have you grown cold, indifferent? Like last week, have you adopted the Jonah mentality? But no, God, I, I don't want you to save them. Ask God to give you a heart that would align itself with the mission of God, one of the salvation of others. One that has a love for fallen humanity. But certainly, God is the one to get all the glory. It's a saving mission. Man's damnation is not God's fault, it's man's fault. And this is further explained in the shocking verses because it's not only the mission of God that highlights God to get the glory and man to get the shame, God to get the glory and salvation, man to get the shame and damnation, but it's also the malice of man or the maliciousness of man. Notice verse 19. This is, this is kind of, you know, sometimes we, we yank John 3.16 out of its context. It's, that's not the end of the story. The story is very much a kind of a tragedy. Because 3.19 says, this is the judgment. Or some of the translations say, this is the verdict. It's very litigious legal language here. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. This is God's verdict. This is God's pronouncement that the light has come into the world. Well, who is the light? Well, when you read the Gospel of John, you find out over and over Jesus himself is referred to light. That's why I think the New American Standard has made the right interpretation and used the capital L with light. In John chapter 1, just in case you're still unconvinced, in John chapter 1, in verse 7, He, that is John the Baptist, came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. The light is Jesus. The light has come into the world. This is, this is the tragedy of the gospel that while the light has come into the world, humankind did not roll out the red carpet for Jesus. Humankind did not welcome their Creator when He came as Redeemer. But as you know, the Gospel of John unfolds and by the final chapters of John, the Creator God, the Eternal Word in human flesh, is hanging on a Roman cross. He was rejected. The light has come into the world. But notice man's response. But men 
Love the darkness rather than the light. What does, in the scriptures, what, what is darkness a metaphor of? It's a metaphor of unrighteousness, sin. It's a metaphor of lies. So that truth and righteousness is a metaphor for light. And that, that's why Jesus himself is called the light. Because he is the incarnation, the enfleshment of truth and righteousness. And so the light has come into the world, but men love the darkness rather than the light. Men love their sin. Men, get this, love lies. They love lies. Lies especially that help them to continue to coddle their love for sin. This is the nature of man. We love the darkness rather than light. Notice he continues on in verse 19. For their deeds were evil. They practice. There's a practicing of that which is loved. There's a practicing of evil because there's a love of the darkness. But not only do they love the darkness, not only are their deeds evil. Notice verse 20. For everyone... Who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. You say, Matt, are you saying that fallen man, fallen humanity, by its very nature, hates Jesus? No, I'm not saying that. Jesus is saying that. I'm just repeating what he said. You say, well, that's not nice. Jesus often doesn't win points for being nice. He tells the truth. And the truth, the reality of fallen humanity, apart from God's saving grace, is that there is a love of sin, a practicing, a love of the darkness, a practicing of evil, and a hatred of the light. We say, well, I know a lot of believers that like Jesus. Well, more often than not, they like a Jesus they've concocted in their own image. I mean, do you ever notice that? You know, well, I think of God as nice and helping people and this and that and and you start to think you just kind of described yourself you're a nice person you like to help people you know he doesn't judge people yeah that's you that's not jesus but jesus should have the right to tell us who he is right and he tells us what man's response is, that they hate the light and do not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. There is an agenda that the unbelieving heart has against the living Christ. There is an agenda. They are opposed to Him. And they don't come to the light for fear. Notice it says fears that their deeds will be exposed. There's a cover-up operation that's taking place. Man in his rebellion against the Creator, as the Creator bears the light down upon his soul, there's a shrinking back. How does humankind shrink back away from the light and try to continue to hide in the darkness? Well, there's many different ways. Another way of saying this, how does humankind try to deal with the reality of their own guilt? Some people try to numb themselves. Abuse drugs or alcohol. Try to escape the feelings of guilt. Some people rationalize it away. Well, there's other people worse than me, so it can't be that bad. Sometimes we use entertainment. 
as a way to just escape and avoid the reality of our own guilt. We spend hours amusing ourselves to death. Sometimes there's a plan to celebrate sin. Well, if we can just get enough people celebrating this rather than, than, than thinking it to be a shameful thing, if we could just get enough people, then we'll all feel better about our sin. And they run from the light. And they hide themselves from the light. And they will not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But friend, this is the good news of the Gospel. You don't need to run. Jesus is with open arms. He comes as the light. He says just, I see it all anyways. It's all plain and open to me. Why try to hide? Why try to run? Don't run from me. Run to me. I've come to rescue you from it. I've come to rescue you from the guilt. I've come to rescue you from the shame. I've come to deliver you from the darkness. But man doesn't come. Man hides from the light. Perhaps some of you at some point in your life have gone on vacation to Hilton Head, South Carolina. It's a pretty popular vacation spot for us northerner people. Well, if you've been down there, you know that once the South Carolina sun goes below the horizon, all these bugs come out at night. And down there, they call them palmetto bugs. But we all know better. Those ain't no palmetto bugs. Those are cockroaches. Giant cockroaches on steroids that could bench press 405 pounds. <laughs> they are enormous. And for whatever reason, the locals, they think that by calling them palmetto bugs, they've evaded the reality. In fact, you can see Palmetto Islands in Palmetto County, and you're thinking, why would you name it Roach County? <laughs> Roach Island. But the point being is that in the midst of the South Carolina sun, all those roaches are gone. You don't see them. But when it's dark, they scurry around, and you don't even want to leave Leave the hotel or wherever you're staying. You don't want to go out there. There's, you're outnumbered. At least 500,000 to one. And so it is with fallen humanity. Scurrying away from the light. Not coming into the light. But content to scurry around in the darkness. But friend, this morning... Perhaps, I won't flatter you, you're like a roach and you're trying to hide. Perhaps you've thought several times throughout this message, you've looked at where the exits are and you're ready to leave. But the light is coming to you this morning, not in the enfleshment of Jesus in our midst, but through the voice of Jesus in the hearing of His Word by the power of His Spirit. And He's calling you to come to the light. He's beckoning you to come to the light. He's telling you to lay down your weapons of warfare. That there's full forgiveness. Whatever, whatever dirt you're trying to hide from Almighty God, He sees it all and He's willing to forgive all. But you need to come to the light. You need to come to Him on His own terms. You need to believe in the name of the Son of God. Believe in all that He is as God, as King, as the One who died for rebels like you and I. Go to the light, my friend. But this is tragically the story of man. One more point on this. One more application. This should inform the way in which 
as believers, we defend the Christian faith? You know, man's problem is not a lack of information. It's, ne- it's that he needs a resurrection. Now, I'm all for, if you know me, I, I love studying apologetics. I love answering the fool according to his folly. But any apologetic method that does not take into consideration that man's root problem is that he hates Jesus is not a helpful apologetic method. It's not understanding rightly man's fallen rebellious state. Now lay out all the answers. We can't open the heart, but we can shut the mouth of the critic. But understand God must raise them from the dead and give them a heart to love Jesus. So God is to get the glory because the mission of God, it's a saving mission. The malice of man, man does not come to the light, hates the light, loves the darkness. Thirdly, the miracle of God. And blessed be God, this section doesn't end at verse 20. Notice verse 21. But, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Not everybody, not all of humanity runs from the light. Not everybody stays in the darkness. And notice how they're described. But he who practices the truth. I love this because again, light is a metaphor. It's obviously speaking of Jesus, but it's a metaphor of truth and righteousness. And so the one who responds by coming to the light, they're the ones who hear the truth about Jesus, believe the truth about Jesus, and begin to practice the truth about Jesus. They're described as those who practice the truth. Those who do the truth. They come to the light. Blessed be God, there are some who come to the light, who practice the truth. But notice, John doesn't end it there. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Did you get that? Yes, some do come to the light. They practice the truth. They believe in Jesus. They live according to what Jesus says. Not perfectly, but in a transformative kind of way. They come to the light. And they come to the light so that it's manifested that all that they're doing, all the good that they're doing in coming to the light and they're practicing the truth is manifested that God did it. This is the miracle of God. This is the miracle of John 3, 8. The wind, He blows wherever, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound of it. You don't know where it comes from or where it is going, so it is with the Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit of God, blows upon some and they come to the light and they practice the truth and it's manifested. God did this. Friend, why is it that you have come to the light? And your unbelieving neighbor, your unbelieving co-worker, your unbelieving family member has not come to the light. Why is it? Hopefully, your answer to that question does not begin with the word, I. I was smarter. I wanted it. I believed it. What distinguishes you from the person who does not come to the light is that God in His amazing mercy was pleased to turn your heart to Him. This 
is why he's the one who gets all the glory for salvation and anybody who continues in unbelief gets all the shame for damnation. A person could never say on judgment day, well God, you didn't do that work in me. No, God says you didn't believe me. You didn't love the light. You didn't want the light. You loved the darkness rather than the light. This is not anything strange in the Gospel of John, right? John 6.37 Jesus says, All that the Father gives me, all that the Father donates to Jesus, will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. John 6.44 No one, Jesus says, can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 65, No one can come unto me, Jesus says, unless it has been granted to him by the Father. And this is what John means in 321, that their deeds are manifest as having been wrought in God. God is the one who did it. God was the one who drew them. God, the Holy Spirit, was the one who regenerated There is never any room for boasting. All glory must go to God. And so friend, are you trying to rob God of His glory that He deserves? Remember John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the one who's to get all the honor, all the praise. So you must thank Him today. If you are one of those who have come to the light, thank Him, praise Him. Give Him the glory that is due His name. Also, as you seek to align your own heart with this saving mission, this should drive us to our knees in prayer. Because nobody will come to the light on them, on their own. But beg God to do that work in them so that they would come. There's a true story, I've mentioned it before from this pulpit of Joshua Bell. In the year 2007, Joshua Bell is a world-renowned violinist. And he chose to go to the Union subway station in Washington, D.C. and to play his violin, his Stradivarius valued at over one million dollars. And he goes there in his street clothes with a tin can sitting in front of him and begins to play away. Most everybody walks by and ignores his playing of the violin. A couple people stop for a minute or two and drop some quarters in the can, not knowing that people pay over $100 tickets for nosebleed sections to go hear him play. You see, the people at that subway station on that day who did not recognize greatness, who did not recognize the beauty of his playing were in judgment. It wasn't anything wrong with his musical abilities. What was wrong was with their perception. In a similar way, the glorious and beautiful Christ has descended from heaven. 
And the tragic story of humanity is that men love the darkness rather than the light. And this is an indictment upon us. But God will get the glory. Seven years later, Joshua Bell played again at Union Station. This time it was a PR event and he made sure there was an audience. God will make sure there's an audience. He will make sure that some do come to the light, that it might be manifest that their deeds have been wrought in God. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this amazing passage. But we're also amazed not only at your glory as a saving God, we're amazed and horrified at the vileness of humanity. That when the light comes, we love the darkness rather than the light. Lord, forgive us. Thank you for opening our eyes to see the light, to come to the light. And may we give you the glory for that. Lord, I also pray for those who still here this morning are sitting in the darkness. Oh God, would they flee to the light, find forgiveness and pardon and newness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to close by singing Shout to the Lord. So let's, uh, let's stand and sing Shout to the Lord. Jesus, my Savior, Lord,